diets have gotten a bad rap recently. And it's easy to see why. Research shows that the vast majority of dieters who lose weight gain it all back within 12 months, and sometimes with a little extra as an added bonus. More people than ever before are overweight, and more people than ever before are going on diets. What's going on here? The fact that Americans collectively lose millions of pounds every year would suggest that diets do in fact work. So why are we continually struggling with long-term sustainable weight loss? What if diets aren't addressing the real problem? Us humans are complex emotional creatures and we eat for a wide variety of reasons. We eat when we're hungry, of course, but we also eat to celebrate holidays and special occasions when we're out with family and friends. But there's a darker side to why we eat. Many of us unconsciously eat to numb painful emotions and feelings. We eat when we're anxious, sad, depressed, and overwhelmed. And eating in this way ultimately brings on more pain, more feelings of shame, humiliation, and guilt, which feeds into a vicious downward spiral. And the best diet in the world isn't going to address the root of this problem. Hello and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach, and my mission is to help you get into the best shape of your life, no matter your age, so you can show up in the second half of your life as the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself. We have a great show for you today. Trisha Nelson is here, and she's going to help us get to the heart of why we overeat and how to stop. But before we get to that, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Living Libations. Living Libations create the healthiest body and skin care products on the planet. They have a full line of beauty products, including skin cleansers, hair care, deodorants, oral care, makeup, perfumes, colognes, and so much more. And I have personally used these products for over five years now. While you're probably familiar with the term gut microbiome, did you know that your skin, which is your largest organ, also has a microbiome? And when you use commercial body products that contain harsh ingredients such as parabens and phthalates and fragrances, you destroy your skin's natural microbiome. Here's a fun experiment. Go to your bathroom and grab your phone, because you're going to need Google for this, and pick out a few of your favorite hygiene products and start Googling the ingredients. Now, compare that to the ingredients in Living Libations products, which is typically only wild harvested essential oils and waters. And guys, this applies to you as well. They have a full line of men's products, including soaps, deodorant, shampoos, and shaving creams. So if you're looking to detox your life and upgrade your health, check these guys out. You can find their full line of products over at livinglibations.com. And because you're a listener of this show, you can get 10% off everything when you use the coupon code SILVEREDGE. That Silver Edge all run together. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on with today's show. My guest today is Trisha Nelson. Trisha is the internationally acclaimed author of the book, Heal Your Hunger, Seven Simple Steps to End Emotional Eating Now. And she's an emotional eating expert who has helped thousands of people heal their relationship with food. I started our conversation by asking Trisha how she got started on her journey to becoming an emotional eating expert. Well, food. I'm an emotional eater. I was, I think, an emotional eater from the get-go. I love to eat. I love to cook. I love to serve it to other people. I love to go out to restaurants. So I was just very, very, very obsessed with food, which would have been fine, really, except for the fact that I gained weight. And so by age 21, I was 50 pounds overweight and, you know, and counting. And I was really unhappy with my body. And I'd already tried many diets many different approaches. I'd been on really tons of diets in my teens. I'd, I'd gone to therapy. I even went to an eating disorders therapist. I went to 
12 step program. So I did a lot of different things to try to get over my weight struggles, but I always ended back up, you know, in the same place um, or worse because. I was a yo-yo dieter, so I'd, you know, lose 30 pounds, gain 20 pounds, lose 10, gain 30, you know, and I had like five different sizes of pants in my closet because I never knew what size I'd be. And I was always holding out for, you know, fitting into those skinny jeans again, but it was hard for me to stay at goal weight because I basically had this emotional connection with food. So when I first heard the term emotional eater, I thought, well, that's not me. I just like food. But over time, I started to recognize that I really did have this emotional connection with food that compelled me to eat, even though I didn't like wasn't necessarily hungry, didn't need the food. And so it was a big struggle for me, but it really wasn't until I addressed the underlying causes of emotional eating that I started to heal. And I, I had a mentor that helped me do that. And then he and I worked together to help other people for decades. And then I started Heal Your Hunger about five years ago, which is an online uh, business where I, I I literally meet with people all over the world through Zoom, you know, and helping them overcome their weight struggles by stopping dieting and starting to deal with emotional eating. And it makes all the difference in the world. I, I love that, obviously. So let's back up a little bit. So you mentioned that you had this relationship with food. It sounds like a very young age. And you said you used the words like I was compelled to eat. And you were overweight and you mentioned that you went to a therapist. What was your frame of mind as a young woman then being overweight and trying unsuccessfully over and over to lose this weight? Well, I have to tell you, it's a very demoralizing experience, okay, because you feel like a loser. I mean, you're not a loser. You keep gaining, but you, you know, I felt like a loser and like I'd look at other people and say, how can they do it? Or how can she eat that and not pay for it? You know, and so I just struggled perpetually and, you know, not fitting into my pants was bad and having this obsession that basically the obsession was very painful itself. And so, you know, especially because it's very secretive, like the whole experience around food is a very shameful one where a lot of times you do what you do in secret. Like you don't binge in front of other people. You eat like a normal person in front of other people. And then when you're alone, it's a different experience. You get out the cookies and the ice cream and the chips and whatever. You go in front, sit in front of the TV and just kind of veg out and do damage. And so you live a double life. You feel very embarrassed. And this is how I felt. And so, and, and, and again, just all the self recriminating, recriminating thoughts, like, like I, what the hell, like, what is wrong with me that I can't do the diet? You know, it's so easy. And then we have other people, this doesn't help We have other people, well-meaning people, spouses or doctors or whatever that are like, we'll just eat less and exercise more. Like we hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, hey, yo, I'm not stupid. I just can't do it. You know, like, of course, that's good advice, except for me, because I, I have this thing with food where I just want to eat and eat meat. So the advice from people who mean well, but don't understand the problem kind of exacerbates the problem, because they look at you like you have three heads, you know, and and you kind of wonder, like, what is, like, I am not, like, I'm a strange being, you know, I'm kind of like this Martian who can't follow the diet, can't do it. And so it, there's a lot of self-hatred and self, you know, a negative self-talk that goes along with it. And that does just make it worse because then we end up beating ourselves up with food, you know, in that dark hole of what's wrong with me, I can't get it, you know. I'm not normal, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's just a very sad existence, honestly. And and it's hard because it's hard to explain to other people who don't have it. And it's hard for people to understand. And you because you have all this shame, you don't want people to know. So there's all this double life stuff happening. And plus, if you're really successful in your life in other areas, like you could be running a company or be doing amazing things in your life, but this one piece of your life, you cannot get a hold of. It's just the most frustrating thing ever. So that uh, the, the, the memory of all that 
is what drives me every day, Kevin. Like I know what it's like to not fit in your pants over and over, to be afraid of putting pants on or afraid of washing pants. Thank God they have Lycra now in (laughs) in clothing because back in the day, like they didn't have any Lycra and they didn't give, you know, so if you washed them, they weren't going to fit, you know, so it's, it is a very dark experience, double life um, that nobody really talks about. So thanks for having me on to talk about it. Yeah. And you and I were talking right before we hit record that this is kind of timely. The last couple of episodes that I've done on this show have talked a little bit about approaching healthy change from a place of self-love, not from a place of self-loathing or from guilt or shame. So your message is, is perfect timing here. And you're right. People don't talk a lot about this, this obsessive eating uh, kind of disorder. And I hadn't thought about the fact that these folks could be leaving this, you call it a shameful, almost a, a second life, a double life, right? They're doing this in secret. You're eating normally in front of, say, friends, family, et cetera, and then binging or eating obsessively at other times. So I just want to back up before we dig into emotional eating and maybe some of the causes and then, of course, how we might get out of that. Let's talk a little bit about the common prescription because we hear this all the time, again, from well-meaning people in the fitness industry and the medical industry, that the way to lose weight is pretty simple. You just have to eat less and exercise more, right? Talk to us a little bit about why that prescription, you've already hit on it, but why doesn't that work for folks that have an emotional eating disorder? If I just say to you, hey, just go out and exercise more and eat less and what's the problem, right? Because you yeah. it's not like you hadn't thought that before, See, right? Exactly. Another piece of uh, sage advice we often get is just moderate, like just have one yeah you know, have one cookie or just, you know, one small bowl of ice cream or whatever. And for people who are addicted to sugar, it's hard to moderate, kind of like the alcoholic having one drink. It doesn't really work out. And so, and we do it to ourselves. We're like, why can't I just eat one? I'm going to try it again. Let me try this. I call it the just one theory. I'm going to have just one, you know, and before you know it, the whole container's gone. And so, you know, it's hard to understand how this happens, but Yeah, that advice doesn't work because basically we're compelled to eat and it goes beyond nutritional knowledge. So we know eating the whole pint of Ben and Jerry's isn't good for us. We know that, but we do it anyway. You know, we know we shouldn't eat the whole bag of chips, but we do it anyway. You know, we know when we have gut distress, you know, we should be staying away from certain foods, you know, sugar or carbs or whatever kinds of foods that aren't good for our bodies. We know that. But what we know intellectually doesn't play up at play out in what we do in our actions. And that's the gap. Like, that's the thing that frustrates people the most, because most people who struggle with food and weight have read a ton of books. OK, like they're not it's they're not a new kid on the block. Like they are reading the books. They're they're listening to the podcast. They're watching, you know, whatever shows and documentaries and, you know, reading the science. They're trying every new fad diet and still they're struggling. So they're very knowledgeable, very knowledgeable, very smart. But it doesn't when you're staring, you know, a cook at a cookie, it doesn't mean a, it doesn't mean anything because you have no willpower. And so I think that's the most frustrating thing is you think you should be able to control it. But if you're an emotional eater and you have that deep emotional connection with food, when that food is serving other purposes for you, and I'll get into what that is about, then it's just, again, it doesn't make any sense. So people are like, why can't you just moderate? Why can't you just eat one? I can't. Like, I can't, you know? And the sooner I accept that, then the sooner I can start addressing what's really going on and why can't I, you know, and and digging into the emotional stuff uh, makes all the difference. So I do want to talk about, if it's okay, talk about something I call the PEP test, which is um, basically we know what foods do to us, unhealthy foods. Like we, we have a pretty idea what they do to us, but we're not thinking about what they're doing for us. Okay. And so this might help people to realize, oh yeah, like, because a lot of people are maybe like I was, and when they heard hear the terms emotional eater, they're like, I don't do that. Like, I just like food. You know, I just like food. Well, that's what I thought. But let me dig into the PEP test. PEP is an acronym, P-E-P. And the first P stands for painkiller. So food helps us. We use it as a painkiller. 
you know, what it, what I mean by pain, uh, a relationship that's gone south, you know, uh, a position at a job that doesn't fit us anymore, or a hellish boss, or a parent that's sick, or a kid that's dysregulated, right? There's enormous numbers of places of pain in our lives, you know, financial stress, whatever. And food softens the edges of life. Like it just softens the edges of painful experiences. And so we turn to it for that. So for somebody who's like, I'm not an emotional eater, you know, think about the times when you reach for food. Are you really that hungry or are you feeling uncomfortable and you want to take the edge off? So that's an important thing. That's P, painkiller. The E stands for escape. And this is when we have fear and anxiety, you know, when our heads are super busy and we want to shut them up. You know, we wanted to take a little break from our overactive mind, which emotional eaters tend to have, like we tend to overthink things, you know, and we want to get our goodies sit in front of the TV and just like get away from it all. So the food does that carbs and sugar, especially we get the serotonin hit, you know, calms us down. We're feeling no pain. We're kind of just in a faraway place. We've, we've been transported momentarily. And the other, the, the last P stands for punishment, which it is a little counterintuitive because we think of our yummy foods as being, you know, I'm going to reward myself with my favorite chocolate and we reward myself with my favorite dessert, pastry, whatever. And it starts out as a reward perhaps, but then it turns ugly when we overindulge and we feel sick and then we're dealing with a couple extra pounds on our body that we got to figure out how to get rid of. That's more of a punishment. It's like, why did I do that again? Like, why did I go there? Why did I lose control? you know, and binge. And so then we're beating ourselves up and we're feeling the effects, you know, of, of really sort of abusing our bodies with food. And we don't think of it as self-abuse, but if you look at the record, you know, when time and time again, you're eating stuff, you know, isn't going to serve you. It begs the question, why do we do that? You know, and overeaters tend to be over feelers and we feel guilty about everything. You know, we're super, again, we have those, that overactive mind, and a feeling of guilt. And so we end up basically beating ourselves up with food. So the pain color, the escape and the punishment, these are drivers. These are ways that food is serving us in the moment. Of course, it all backfires, but really important to see that, yeah, we are using food beyond nutritional need. It, we are emotionally leaning on food. And I think that's just kind of the, I call it the pep test. It's like next time you're going to the refrigerator, like for the umpteenth time, ask yourself what's going on because we're just used to doing it unconsciously. But we have to start getting a little bit more aware, like something's up. I'm not feeling comfortable and I'm using food as a result. That's a great recap of emotional eating, of why we're emotional eating, right? That pep test, we're eating because we're in pain, some sort of emotional pain to escape from feelings of anxiety or depression or whatever it is. And feelings of, I thought about the punishment. That's an interesting psychological aspect there as well, but certainly can see how that, that could come into play. Now, why do you think it is that when we are doing this emotional eating, because let's face it, nobody emotionally eats kale and chicken breast. We just don't. <laughs> right. You had mentioned carbs and sugar, and those are the things we go for, right? It's these ultra processed foods, these things that are, why, why are we in these? Because everybody can relate to what you're saying, even if they're not full blown emotional eating disorder folks, we've right. all done that, right? When we're anxious, when we're depressed, when we're even when we're bored, right? The foods we tend to reach for aren't very healthy. They don't serve us nutritionally. Why do you think that is? Yeah, well, they, cause they work. I mean, when you eat a pastry, you feel good. You know, you forget your troubles, you know, you're like in that momentary ecstasy, you know, and I had somebody tell me recently, she's like, yeah, but Trisha, when I when I stop overeating, I don't feel good. You know, like I can't, I need to go back to my happy place. And, you know, it begs the question, like, why aren't you happy without carbs and sugar? Like what? Let's take a look there. That's a problem. If you need constant food to make your life exciting, we got to look at your life, you know, like it just, that cannot be the solution to your ills, you know? And so, and I think it's just so easy to get in that habit of snacking and making that your crutch and not looking at the problems of life. And the reason why diets don't work is because those problems surface. If you're not eating, if you're not overeating and you get a really clean diet, stuff's going to come up. 
you know, stuff's going to come up. And if you don't have the tools to deal with that stuff, you're going to last about two weeks. You know, your last two weeks, you know, the, the thrill of a new diet is true for everybody. Like I'm doing it, like I'm going to get it together, you know, and you feel good for a little time. People are starting to compliment you. Your, your complexion's better. You got a spring in your step. But after a couple of weeks, it gets hard. And then you're like, geez, I just want to eat, you know, a brownie. I just need some relief. And that's what food is. It's relief for us. But it begs the question, relief from what? You know, let's find new ways to cope with life. When food is your only coping tool, you're only going to last a couple weeks or a month at best. Maybe you can last nine months or something. I did once. I last, I lost 40 pounds once. And then I got depressed because all the stuff I would buried was coming up to the surface and I didn't have new tools. Diets don't give you new tools. You know, they give you nothing, but let's take these things away and you'll be happy. Not really. Yeah, that's that's very, very well said. If we don't change any of these underlying behaviors, going on a restrictive diet, doing something you don't want to do that you don't like, that's not not enjoyable. I mean, it's it's a Band-Aid to yeah. your point. Yeah, you might start to feel a little better. You might you might lose some weight. But if you're not addressing those underlying causes. So before we move into some strategies, and I think I know where we're going to go here on how we get away from emotional eating, let's talk a little bit about food addiction, food as a drug. I've heard somebody said that food is the most abused anti-anxiety and anti-depression medication in the Western world. What's, talk to us a little bit about eating disorders, eating addictions, and emotional eating. Are they similar, the same thing? Are they different things? Yeah, great question. I like the term emotional eating because it's kind of an umbrella term for all, for all different kinds of disordered eating. You know, whether you're overeating or undereating, it's emotionally driven. You know, if you're, you have tight control of food, if you're kind of orthorexic or you're obsessed with what you're eating and you're super careful about everything, your carbs, your ketones and this, that and the other, you're obsessed for one thing. And, you know, you can be just as obsessed with not overeating or having tight control as you can be with getting your next fix from the next binge. Both serve that same purpose, the painkiller, the escape and the punishment. So I like emotional eating because whether it's under or over eating, you know, whatever you're doing with food, exercise, you're, you're basically, you know, using it in some way emotionally. Okay. It has nothing to do with your physical need. All right. So that's one thing I consider emotional eating to be a spectrum where I think we're all emotional eaters. Like we all can go overboard once in a while, of course, you know, and, and it is an emotional connection we have with food. Think of a mother and her child breastfeeding her child. Like there's, there's a bonding experience there. So it's built into us. It's just that some people go way too far with it. Now it's a spectrum with emotional eating on the low end and food addiction on the high end. Okay. And all food addicts, I think, are emotional eaters. Not all emotional eaters are food addicts. And so I was definitely a food addict. What does that mean? Well, I used food to excess and to my detriment. So classic signs of addiction are, you know, can you start stop once you start? For me, it was no. If I was eating chips, the whole bag was going to be devoured. You know, if I was eating ice cream, I'd eat the whole container. I just didn't. I took the lid off and got a spoon. Like, that's it, you know, and didn't put the lid back on. So food addicts will eat to excess, okay? They'll eat in spite of negative consequences, which is a classic sign of addiction. Like your doctor says you're pre-diabetic. Stop eating sugar. And you don't. You don't stop eating sugar, okay? Well, that's an addictive habit. You know, if you're eating it, even though you know it's going to destroy your body, you know, and put you in peril, and we do it anyway. Look at the pandemic. It's clear now. If you have excess weight on your body, you are at high risk of dying from viruses, okay? That is some serious stuff, you know, and, that, and yet we will just pretend that's not true and we'll keep eating. So that is an addictive habit. We, when we eat in spite of family, you know, saying things to us, our family may not be so direct as to say, hey, you ought to lose some weight, 
but they might be concerned, you know, or our spouse might be kind of bummed out that we don't want to have sex anymore because we just feel so gross about our bodies and don't want to be touched and have no libido. You know, it's like affecting our life or perhaps it affects our finances because our binges add up. The cost adds up. So there's so many effects of this condition, joint pain, joint replacements, autoimmune issues, gut issues. I mean, think of all the, you know, the ripple effect of health issues we have. When I talked about that spectrum of emotional eating and food addiction, I actually have a quiz on my website, healyourhunger.com, where you can take the quiz and find out where you are literally on that spectrum. And the two things that really qualify where you end up on the spectrum are how much control you have. Like, can you scale back? Can you be like, whoa, ate too much on that cruise. I'm going to like jog more and get these five pounds off. Okay, not too many consequences and uh, enough control that you can scale back and course correct. Versus somebody on the high end who has very little control. Once they start eating or they go off the rails with their diet, they have trouble getting back on course. Okay, that's somebody very low control. And if they do that long enough, for decades enough, they're going to have major consequences. Their body's going to be pissed off. So that's really how you know where you're on the spectrum. But the quiz makes it super easy because you get a personalized score. But it is a spectrum. It's a spectrum. We're all on there somewhere. And it's just really important to realize that if you do it long enough and beat your body up long enough, it's going to definitely have major consequences. Yeah, there are, uh, of course, health consequences, and we're probably hearing more and more now in the in the midst of the crisis about the health dangers of obesity. But there's also a lot of health dangers associated with what you call yo-yo dieting, right? That constant cycle of losing and gaining weight just wreaks metabolic havoc on our bodies. All right, so we've painted a pretty grim picture here of emotional eating and food addiction. And I love to, I love the way you think of that on a spectrum, right? You, everybody's an emotional eater to some degree, right? We all eat for emotional reasons. We, nobody just eats only for the nutrition, but now somebody that's a little further along on that unhealthy scale of emotional eating. I know your book is heal your hunger, seven steps to end emotional eating. Now, what are some tips that we can give folks that are listening to this to help them, maybe they're thinking, yeah, that's me, that you're, you know, maybe for the first time they're hearing this message thinking, holy moly, I've been listening to all these podcasts like mine, the over 50 health and wellness. And this guy's telling me, well, I should, I should eat less and move more. And maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. Right. But now somebody's here talking about emotional eating and all that conventional advice goes out the window until you course correct until we get to this foundational, these foundational things, right? What are some things that we can do if, we decide that we, or we suspect that we have an, a problem with emotional eating. Yeah. So, you know, I think the awareness is the first thing, obviously. So this is really important, but I think it's important, first of all, for people to realize that if they've had this problem for a long time, they're probably not going to be able to overcome it on their own. So I just want to sort of venture that if you can't do it on your own, that, you know, you should consider getting some support with it. And I, I mentioned that because so many people, because there's so much shame around this condition, people will think to themselves, well, I should be able to control what I put in my mouth. Like, that's kind of dumb. You know, like, why, why would I reach out for help for that? Like, I, this is, I'll take care of this myself, you know, but how well has that worked? You know, and we don't think twice about hiring a trainer to get fit. We know we need accountability in the gym. I mean, I, it helps me. I go to a bar class where I have a teacher there and there's other people there and, and it makes me do it. It makes me not quit. I would quit halfway through. I promise you. <laughs> I would make it 20 or 25 minutes and then I'd be out of there. I would not last a full hour. But the accountability of doing it in a group with other people definitely helps having a, you know, a teacher there definitely helps. But when it comes to food, we have so much shame that we think, oh, that's so silly. I should be able to do it on my own. But I just want to remind people, this is like the most addictive habit there is because you have to eat, you know, like it's not like alcohol where you can put your, put the plug in the jug and walk away and never go into a bar. It's not the same. You have to eat. Food is everywhere. Everybody's pushing it. Everybody's pushing holiday time, candy and cookies and cake, you know, eggnog. So it's like, it's the hardest. It's temptations everywhere. It's so much easier if you get support. And 
if you learn how to address the underlying causes, which chances are you don't know because you've been focused so long on food and weight and diet and exercise. So it's a whole new deal. And so I just really encourage people to stop saying to themselves, oh, I should be able to do it because you're probably knocking your head against the wall time and time again, every time you try to, you know, go on a new, new deal and then, and then fall down. But beyond that, I would say that it starts with slowing down, you know, emotional eaters or overeaters in general tend to be overdoers. And we're really like busy. (laughs) If you want to get something done, give it to an emotional eater. Why? Because we don't want to slow down and feel our feelings. Like we're on the run, right? We're on the run. We don't want to stop for a minute. Otherwise we might feel something. And the whole point of overeating is just just to avoid our feelings. And so meditation is like, are you kidding me? Like, there's no way I'm going to sit down and shut up because God knows what my head's going to start saying if I do that. So it's really important to know that it's slowing down is actually a thing. It's hard for us. It's actually like terrifying for us. And yet you can't keep going at the pace you're going and expect to lose weight because if you go at breakneck speed in your life and you pack your schedule with appointments and you're constantly doing things for other people, guess what? You're going to be stressed out. You're going to be stressed out, tired. Your adrenals are going to be exhausted. And of course, you're going to be reaching for snacky foods throughout the day for stamina, coffee and chocolate and, and this kind of thing. So we have to slow down. Self-care is the name of the game for sure. And so many people don't even have a nodding acquaintance with what self-care means. It's not bubble baths and manicures. You know, self-care is, hey, I got to put my oxygen mask on first. You know, like I have to uh, meditate first thing in the morning, read something inspirational, go for a walk. I have to like, I call it putting money in our spiritual bank account. We need resources to draw on. You can't just take food away and expect to be happy. We talked about that. It doesn't work, you know? So if you're going to not depend on food, you have to depend on something else. So we have to build into those resources. We have to invest in ourselves, time in ourselves and our spiritual, you know, resources. Put money in your spiritual bank account first thing in the morning. You can make withdrawals throughout the day. Instead of reaching for chocolate and coffee, you know, you can reach with inside, you know, and have some spiritual sustenance. Other things that we need to do is check our schedule, like maybe not pack so much into our schedule, maybe learn how to say no. That's not easy to do for most leaders. We tend to be people pleasers. You know, we want everybody to like us. We want the, you know, the out of girls or the out of boys that come from coming to the rescue, you know, always swooping in to do the project, host the party, whatever, because we tend to get validation from outside of ourselves. You know, we may not have had it growing up. We may have had dysfunction in our families and we we tend to look outside ourselves for validation. And that might have helped us as a kid get through whatever we were getting through. But as adults, it's dysfunctional when we're constantly overdoing and constantly picking up other people's slack. It means we're going to be exhausted, but we're also going to be resentful. Because nobody's ever as pleased as we plan on them being, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> that's like, yeah, no, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, people, we get like an offhand of thank you. We're like, thank you. I just pulled an all nighter for this project. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? You know? So it, it creates problems. This is why it's more of a living problem than an eating problem. It's how we're living, you know? And the good news is, it really is our patterns that need to be changed. Like, like I used to think I was a victim of chocolate cravings. Like I was just going along my day and boom, like a lightning striking. I was like obsessed with chocolate. But no, I create a lot of the cravings through my own stress that I create through people pleasing, through being a rescuer or a caretaker, taking on other people's burdens. Like it's a habit for emotional eaters. This is the stuff that creates cravings. But we're trying to find some pill that removes our cravings. No, it goes deeper than that. And the good thing about that is we can change what we do to create a different experience around food. To me, that's great news. The great news is if I start saying no, if I start putting myself first and and taking time for self-care, which by the way is not selfish, 
It's actually the best thing I can do for people around me is to take care of myself first, take time to chill out. People think, oh, you know, I couldn't possibly do that. So selfish. I have a family or, you know, whatever. It's like, yeah, but if you don't do that, you're, you're harried, you're busy, you're overworked, you're tired and you're kind of bitchy, you know, like your family's not getting the best version of you. Who are we kidding? When you're being, you know, the savior to all other people's issues, you know, you're not at your best, you know, so your family, if you want to be selfless, take time for yourself so they can have a joyful, present parent or spouse, you know, like that's so, so important. So there's a lot that goes into creating a new relationship with food. And that's why diets are not going to cut it. You know, that's a very superficial solution for a problem that is not about food and weight. Yeah, I, I love how you explain that a diet's not going to fix a problem that's not about food or weight. I love that you went where you went with that. The specifically the self care piece because I think so many people, women especially, that have that caregiver gene, and it could be a, a men as well, but they are so busy taking care of everybody else that they they fail to do the things. And what did you say? Self care is not selfish, right? Yeah. They fail to realize that when they take good emotional, spiritual, physical care of themselves, they show up as a better human being all around. They're better parents. They're better moms. They're better siblings. They're better coworkers and friends. They're better people in their communities and their beauty can shine out of them in a much, much higher intensity when they're doing that basic self-care for themselves. I also wanted to go back because you kind of, as we got into the self-care piece, you were talking a lot about this emotional eater being that person always on the go and stress, 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 and pushing those cortisol levels and adrenal glands all the time. And we know that that also is not going to end well for healthy body composition. Those Now we have things that are emotionally and psychologically working against us, but we're also putting our body and perhaps we're also yo-yo dieting on top of all this other stress. We're putting in our body in a position where it's really, really going to be hard, hard to do sustainable long-term weight loss. Is that is that fair? A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, it's really... You know, we're sensitive beings, you know, we're sensitive beings and our bodies, especially as we age, you know, we have to really, really uh, clue into the stress piece because yeah. stress is so impactful to our body and plays such a role in our, you know, in our, our disease and anything that comes up in terms of disease and re regarding recovery, like stress and sleep are going to play huge parts in that. So it cannot be ignored. Our bodies and our stress levels cannot be ignored. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. I I kind of look at, when I talk about health, health and uh, wellness, I, I talk about this three-legged stool. There's what we, you know, our nutrition piece, what we eat, how we eat. There's the movement piece, so exercise and, and body movement. And then there's that recovery piece. And of course, there's recovery if you're very active. You got to recover between your workouts, et cetera. But really recovery is the thing you're talking about, right? It's like, it's having that meditation or that journaling practice. It's that having a healthy sleep hygiene practice and guarding that carefully. It's working actively to de-stress your life and show up as a better human. And I think that that, that you really can't have, you can't have a two-legged stool. It doesn't work very good. You got to have all three of those working together. So Trisha, I want to take this conversation just a slightly different direction. There's been, I'm sure you're aware, there's a, there's a healthy at any size movement that's pretty prevalent right now and fairly vocal. And we can talk about health on a number of different levels. But what I want to get at is I've recently read an article, and this seems to be, there seems to be a, the fitness industry has a anti-fat bias or is anti-fat and, and participates in fat shaming. And it's got me thinking, I've read through some of these articles and there was one in particular that said, hey, if you're a trainer, read this and learn how to communicate with, don't be a fat shamer. But the whole article was kind of based on the premise that the entire fitness industry is engaged in this fat shaming or anti-fat bias. And it got me thinking here, how do we talk to, how does somebody like me talk to an obese person in a loving, compassionate, empathetic way 
to help move them into a healthier lifestyle. It seems to me like you've got a lot of that figured out. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you reach out to people that are overweight, unhealthy, with a message that's not shameful or come off as anti-fat or fat shaming? Well, thank you for the question. I think what happens and why it lands for obese people as fat shaming, and I think this is as important for somebody who's got excess pounds on them as well as for somebody who's in a trainer type position. People can't do the eat less, exercise more if they're emotional eaters, right? We've talked about that. And what happens is when that's pretty much what's out there as advice, you know, if that's pretty much what conventional wisdom has to offer, it's going to fall in deaf ears for those who have done that like 20 times. Okay. Like, like we, those of us who have been obese have tried it. And for those who try it longer than I did, you know, who didn't have the benefit of the solution I found, you try it long enough and you're like, no mas, like I cannot, I don't want to hear it, screw it, I'm not going to try anymore. It's too discouraging, like to go on a diet, do great for time, have your trainer, you know, like you're doing amazing. And then to go dark where you've fallen down the hole of binging, you don't want to show up at your uh, scheduled time with your trainer. You don't want your trainer to see that you're busting out of your, you know, of your gym shorts. It's very shameful and humiliating. And it's like so demoralizing and so discouraging that you don't want to try anymore. You know, and I think that's what's not being said is that people who are like, screw you, I'm okay being fat. I read between the lines and I say, look, I've been fat and thinner's better. I'm not going to lie. I'm not, you know, I'm lying to myself. If I say I'm good with fat, it's more that I'm resigned with fat because that whole eat less, exercise more thing doesn't freaking work. Stop trying to sell it to me. It doesn't work. And I, I'm not going to put myself through it again. I won't do it. And so we have to kind of recalibrate and say, look, I'm better off just trying to be healthy and at the weight I am rather than go through that terrible roller coaster ride of discouragement again, hopeful and then discouraged. I mean, so many people come to me and they're so afraid to hope. You know, I mostly have people with uh, lots of excess weight on them who come to me for help and they are terrified to hope. They're terrified to spend money on themselves again. They're like, oh my God, I've done this so many times you know my spouse is rolling their eyes you know they're like really you're gonna do yet another something you know and I have to explain yeah but if you're dealing with emotional eating you're not doing the same thing you've always done like you're what you're doing is you're finally getting underneath this thing and getting to the root cause this is a different deal and it is and they have results right away because I literally tell people to stop weighing themselves I'm like enough already. Let's get off the diet track. Like you don't need need to be obsessed. You don't need to let the scale tell you how you're supposed to feel that day. If it's, uh, you know, if it's up, I'm going to be pissed off. If it's down, I'm going to be all excited. But here's what happens with the emotional eater. This is maybe if tra- trainers are listening. When, when the scale tells us something we're excited about, then we have wiggle room to eat some. Okay. Now I can eat that pastry because I just lost a few pounds. If it tells us something we don't like, we're like, man, I just spent a week at the gym. Clearly going to the gym doesn't work, right? And we give up. So we are ruled by that scale and the number on that scale. And it goes in the opposite direction. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't fare well for us because it's such a head trip. So I tell people, just stop weighing yourself. Maybe weigh yourself once a month if you have to. But let's stop focusing on the food and the weight. Let's start focusing on the self-care. You know, let's deal with the self-care and let's deal with having a healthier relationship with food. Let's find new tools for dealing with your emotions, with dealing with your stress and let the weight take care of itself. If you're not emotionally eating, you will lose weight. It's an automatic thing. But Jesus, the, the focus on food and weight is exhausting and it's, it's a no-win situation. So I just think that's 
you know, that that's where a lot of that, you know, kind of resentment at talk about losing weight comes from is like, yo, I tried it. It doesn't work. So let's stop talking about it. Thanks for your thoughts there. A lot of that lands with me. I hear the, we hear in the fitness space, it's popular to say that diets don't work. Well, look, we can't get around the law of thermodynamics. Yeah. Right? less than you and you're going to lose weight but the problem isn't losing the weight it's the problem is that long-term sustainable lifestyle where you have a healthy body composition over that time and i think that what you're saying is that as opposed to prescribing a diet here's here's how many calories i want you to eat here's how many times i want you to go to the gym what we're going to do is back up and say hey let's change our relationship with ourselves with our food with our bodies and as opposed to coming into this like oh why can't why, why do I always fail at this? And maybe this time will work instead say, Hey, look, I, I want to approach this, not from a place of guilt or shame, but from a place of self-love, right? We've done some of this work you've talked about and kind of flip that script around a little bit and say, Hey, I love myself. I'm perfect as I am as a spiritual being. I am amazing. But if I'm being perfectly honest with myself, I haven't taken the best care of my body. And in order to do that, I need to make some changes and I need to do some work that's probably not specifically a diet yeah. right, or an exercise regimen. And I, I need to lay this foundation for a healthy lifestyle first. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I, I think that it can be tough for somebody that's muscular or thin talking to an unhealthy population sometimes saying, hey, I really, really, because I'm passionate about this, yeah. right? People that get into, people that are coaches and doing what you do, right? We've almost all of us got here because of some event in our lives, yeah. right? And we're passionate. And we want to share that. And I, I'm very, very cautious and conscious that I don't come across as fat shaming or fat sure. biased. And, and I see this and this is getting a lot of traction in the popular media and probably because some of these media companies are realizing, Hey, this is a big untapped market and it's growing, right? right? There's unfortunately yeah. obesity is, is especially during the last two years during the, the pandemic. Well, Trisha, again, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your thoughts there. I really appreciate that. As we start to wrap up here, you've accomplished a lot. You've got a fantastic message. What's next for you? What's on the horizon? I think just carrying the message farther and wider. You know, I, I uh, just had my TEDx talk go live on the TEDx website. So um, in the titles, Emotional Eating, What If Weight Loss Isn't About Food? <laughs> so very obviously apt for our conversation mm -hmm. here. So that's really exciting and hopefully will lead to more speaking opportunities. But the big thing is I'm in serving my clients. You know, I do all my programs on Zoom and I have a quit sugar challenge that I do quarterly, which is really great for people because we in, in, in community for five days, we work on quitting sugar. There's a lot of people that need the support for that. It's not so easy to do. And when you, when you couple it with the mindset piece, so in my Quit Sugar Challenge, I do morning mindset classes as well. So it's not the mechanics of quitting sugar only, like where sugar hiding in your foods, all the different 80 names for sugars, you know, how to get off of it, you know, great recipes for getting off of it, you know, and still enjoying your food, but also the mindset piece, like how can I quit sugar? It's like, it's like the only thing that's getting me by. So that's really important and obviously leads to the emotional eating conversation. So, so yeah, I just, I, I, I'm very blessed in that I get to wake up and do what I love to do more than anything in the world. And I, because I know the pain and humiliation of, you know, overeating and, and, and not having your clothes fit, it really does make me excited every day to be able to bring, you know, this message of hope and also a very step-by-step -step process for helping people. And I really do take the guesswork out of it. A lot of people think you need to go do 20 years of therapy in order to deal with your underlying causes, but I make it really easy by just showing people, you know, the 24 traits of the emotional eater that usually are their downfall and then very practical steps for uh, making changes. So that's the good news is it doesn't have to take that long. Yeah, no, that is good news. So somebody listening to this and they're identifying with your message, how can they connect with you? Yeah, I would say start with the quiz. Go to healyourhunger.com, H-E-A-L, healyourhunger.com. Take the uh, emotional eating quiz, which will tell if you're an emotional eater or a food addict or somewhere in between. Start there. Definitely subscribe to my podcast, The Heal Your Hunger Show, where I 
pretty per- I'm pretty personal about emotional eating in my own life and and different you know face you know, deal with those underlying causes in on my show. And my book is always good for people. It's a it's a great way to start sort of changing the paradigm, getting out of the diet mentality. You know, this food's good, that food's bad. And start really digging into, you know, why we are emotionally so connected to food. So that's Heal Your Hunger. And that's on Amazon. And it's in, on Audible, too, where you could, it's like a five-hour listen. Okay. And are you active on social media as yep, well? On, in, on Instagram, media? it's Trisha Nelson underscore, underscore at the end of Nelson. Um, and I do a lot on there. And I also have a group on Facebook called The Secret Sauce to End Emotional Eating. So anybody can jump in there and get support, too. Okay, great. Thanks. And I'll put all of that information into the show notes here and folks can find that there. So Tricia, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today, sharing your personal story, as well as all of your knowledge and your wisdom and especially your your inspiration. And I certainly wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. Thanks so much for having me. You have a great show. You've got a great podcast voice. Wow. <laughs> um, and thanks to everybody for listening. Okay, folks, that's our show for this week. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. You can find all the links to the resources we discussed in this episode over at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 106. And you can continue the conversation over there as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on today's show. As we wrap up our time together today, you can show your support for this show in two important ways. One is to tell a friend about this podcast and encourage them to give it a listen. The second is to give this podcast a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on and be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss any future episodes. I also want to let you know that if you've enjoyed this podcast, I have other free resources over at silveredgefree.com. There you'll find guides with my top tips on exercise, nutrition, and lifestyle. So feel free to head over there and download anything that looks useful to you in your health and wellness journey. I really appreciate you spending your time with me today. And until next time, stay strong. <laughs>